Uh, we just moved to a, new, a bigger place for those people who don't know, for those people who are listening. Uh, we moved to a new place. But there's a rule for Breslov, and we're going to say this, and I hope the guys who are running this place are hearing, the, are hearing this, because this is a very important point. In 1980, there was a big, uh, big uh, change in, in the Breslov community in Yerushalayim. Chaim Kramer, who was the, the guy in charge of the, the Breslov books in English, at the time, he was in charge of the Kolel, the yeshiva, the Breslev yeshiva in Masharim. Rabbi Deo Chaim Rosen was the Rosh Yeshiva, and Rabbi Chaim Kramer was put in charge of the Kolel. And somehow, miraculously, he got a donor to, to bring in good money, and it was enough to fill in the entire building. It was unbelievable. And it, and it was a Kolel that paid good money, and, and it, was, it was also not necessarily to draw in just Breslevers, but to, and, and to recruit, in a way, people who wanted to learn. They had a schedule, and they were paying good money, that they were learning five pages of Gemara a day. It was super fast, it was to cover ground. And they also had a shir in Rabbi Nachman's teachings. So, the, the, she, the rest of Shul and Nashayim was filled. Every floor, the top floor was filled. Downstairs was filled. They needed more benches. They took the Breslov bookstore on Masharim Street. They took half of the store. They closed it off. They put a mechitza. And they put in benches. And they were learning there also. It was like the geula. People couldn't imagine in Breslov to have this happen. It was too good to be true. Because always Breslov was something broken and shabby and on the corner and dirty and, and on the side. And no one paid attention to it. And all of a sudden, they had a big yeshiva and tons of people coming. And it was big. And Rabbi Deo Chaim Rosen, the Rosh Hashiva, for two weeks he didn't say anything. He didn't, like, he didn't comment anything. He didn't say to Chaim Kramer, who, who succeeded in getting somebody to bring in the money, you know, Shkoyach, Chazaku Baruch, like a compliment, nothing. For two weeks. After two weeks, people started to complain. What is this? We have no time to learn any more Midrash even. We're learning five pages of Gemara a day. We have hardly time to go to Meron. We can't do what we want anymore. What is this? You know, and then you guys, you guys change the whole schedule. This is not breast lift, the, the learning and everything. And at that point, Rabbi El Chaim Rosen, he said to Chaim Kramer, Shkoyach. He said, can I ask you why after two weeks you went, you waited to tell me Shkoyach? So he said like this, this is an amazing Musa, this is an amazing point. He said, when it happened, it was like a dream. It was too good to be true. So I, so I thought that this was not coming from the side of holiness. This is coming from the side of Tuma. Because it's too good to be true. I said, there's, there must be something wrong. There has to be a catch. Because in life, whenever there's a Kedusha, Rabbi Nachman says in Lesson 22, you have what's called Kol Dikdusha, a holy voice. And you have what's called a Kol Habara. You have an echo. Whenever you have a holy voice which is aroused, you have to have facing it an echo. We see that by Eliyahu Navi when he was fleeing from King Ahav. So he got to the house of the Tsarfit, the, the, the woman from Tsarfat, Tsarfat, Tsarfit, how it's pronounced, whatever. And she took care of Eliyahu Navi. But as soon as Eliyahu came, his, her, daughter, her, her child died. And she said, Bata la avoni. You came now to, to, to make known and arouse my sin. So what she said is, until you came along, Navi, I was the tzaddikah, I was the righteous woman, uh, the righteous person of, the, of the, whole, the whole city, the whole area. And now that you've come, and compared to you, I'm nothing. So now, all of a sudden, the prosecution in heaven, they're looking at my sins, because compared to you, I'm garbage. And now all these bad things are happening. So that Rabbi Nachman brings this idea to illustrate when a high level of Kedusha is revealed, you have to have with it an echo. There has to be a commensurate and equal to it, uh, a voice coming from the other side. And that's the indication if something is holy or not, if you have this echo or not. So Rabbi Deo Chaim Rosen, he told, he told him for two weeks nothing was happening. It was just like Ganed and everyone is flying and learning and everything. I was, I was shaky. I, I, I'm not sure about it. But now that people are complaining and they're unhappy and everything, so ah, now I know it's from the Kedusha. So now I say Shkoya. And this rule applies in many things. Rabbi Avram Sternhartz, there's a story of Avram Sternhartz who was the, was, the, was the Rav, was actually the Rav, the Halachic Rav in the city of Kremenchak. And the story goes that there were two police officers and they had a Jew like chained. And they came to the Jewish community that, you know, we want, uh, we'll, we'll for ransom money, we'll free this Jew. He's, he did things against the government and this and that. And we need the big amount. They came armed with guns and everything. They were, we're going to kill him. If we don't come up with like 10,000 rubles within a, a day, we're going to kill him. 
So uh, the Rav of Kremen Shag, it's, Pico, it's Pidyon Shmuim, it's one of the biggest mitzvot to free Jews who are trapped and everything. So he quickly went to the wealthy Jewish houses in Kremen Shag to ask for the money. So he went to one and he, and he broke it up, who he's going to go to and how much he's going to ask each one. So he came to the first house and, he, and the man asked, how much do you need for the mitzvah? He says, I need 500. 500? Take 1,000. He gave him 1,000 instead of 500. He went to the other guy's house, the other wealthy gvir, the, the guy who had money. And he, said, and he said, there's a mitzvah, pidyon, shvuim, and everything. How much you need? 500. 500, that's it, take a thousand. So then it went on, he had the money within half the time. He had all the money, each one gave double. So Rabbi Shtonarts had all the money in his hand. And before he went to, the, to give to the, to the two guards, you know, the two police officers who were armed and everything, the money, he went to the basement there, she called all the young men who were living in Kremenchag, Shiva boys, come secretly. And he said, bring bats. And I want you, when I call out, to start beating the hell out of the two police officers. And, and not just the police officers, of the, of, the, of the Jew. The Jews tied up, beat them hard. He said, what? Just do what I told you. So he came with all the money, and all the boys were hiding in the bushes with these bats behind them. And Rabbi Amishan says, now. So they all came and started to beat them up. <laughs> so then the, the Jew was chained, and the police officers, you Jews, how do you know? <laughs> how do you know? It turned out that he wasn't Jewish, the prisoner. He was one of their fellow con men. He was a goy who pretended to be a Jew and they thought they could get money out of the Jews by doing this trick. So they beat them up, they beat the hell out of all three of them and they fled. So they asked Rabbi Sternatz, how did you know? How could you, do you have Ruch HaKodesh? How did you know to, to, to see you through this? He said, I saw from the mitzvah. It was too easy. It was too good to be true. I asked for 500, the guy gave me 1,000. The other one, every, all the money came in half the time. I said, this, that's not from the Kedusha. There's no mitzvah here. There's no Mesirat Nefesh. There's no difficulty. Ah, there's something wrong here. It's not a mitzvah. Be careful. And that's a rule for everything in life at age 15, at age 25, at age 40, at age 50, at age 60, that you have to have a fight. The boxing match is at every shlav. And that boxing match is the indication that there's Kedusha here. One of Rav Nossin's, I'm going off a little because this is important, a uh, dosage of Chizuk here. Rav Nossin has one of the most beautiful discourses in the Kutalachot. It's called Yukot HaShachar Alach It's based on the story of the exchange children. The Banim Shenit Chalfun, Rabbi Nachman stories. I think it's story number 10, am I correct? 10 or 9, do you remember? Well, 9 or 10, one of those two. The exchange children, yeah, the Banim Shenit Chalfun. I think it's number 10. Or 11, I forgot already, 10 or 11, one of those two. So in the story, it's based on that story, and Rav Nossin is filled with constant chizuk. He says something powerful there. He says, if you see that the Yetzirah is attacking you, it's because you're, somebody, you're something very special, because you're precious, you have a value. The Yetzirah is investing time to make that you can't dive in, that you can't serve Hashem properly, that you can't be besimcha, you can't learn, you can't be normal, because there's a treasure in you, and he's doing his best to keep it down. And his biggest accomplishment is informing you that you're a garbage, that you're nobody, that there's no hope. That's his success point. And that Rav Nassim says emanates what's called in the Kabbalistic terminology, Hechaleat Murot, the exchanged chambers. There's what's called in the Kabbalah, the exchanged chambers. That means the Yetzirah, he has the ability to fool people and make an exchange. And this world, because it's called Olam, which is concealment, we, we're already starting on the wrong footing as soon as we come into this world, that everything's upside down. The evil in this world is considered good, and what's good is considered downtrodden and garbage and ich and no one pays attention to. Like we see, secular society is the, is the big thing, making money, famous, big house, gorgeous bodies, strong, clothing, the world, power, government, everything, that, that, that is the important in the world. And to learn Torah, to invest in the world to come, to David Hashem, to Muna, it's touching to some people and it's, it's getting out, but commensurate to the amount of people in the world that there are, it's still a drop, it's almost nothing. It's nothing, it's fine. You say, oh, there's so many classes now on the internet, there's so much Torah. Yeah, <laughs> For, compared to you, but now compared to the world, it's nothing still, it's like a drop. Because there's so much garbage out there, there's so much misconceptions in the world. All this, what Rosan says, comes from Echalei Atmurot. And because David HaMelech is the one, he's the one who was and is going to, he's Melech HaMashiach who comes from David HaMelech, 
to bring the world, to put back that the Melucha, the kingship should be in the right place, should be with Hashem, with the Torah, with the Tzaddikim. Because of this, David HaMelech suffered more than anybody else. This whole exchange, him coming into the world was through what? Through Ruth. Ruth is descended from who? From Lot with his daughters. Such an upside down story. And then Yehuda and Tamar, upside down story. And then he was supposed to be a miscarriage, he was supposed to be a nephil. And Adam Arisham gave 70 years of his life as a gift to David HaMelech. And his brothers were against him. Even when, before he was born, when the mother was pregnant with, uh, with David HaMelech, the brothers tried to bump her stomach to make her have a miscarriage in order he shouldn't be born. He was pursued even from before he was born, before the Neshama came down. All this because the exchange chamber did not want to let down David the Melech to come because he, more than anybody else, is going to bring, the, bring and he brought the weapon to get out of the exchange. What is it? Va'ani Tfila. The whole Indian of David the Melech is prayer. To teach people your weapon, how to remind you that you're precious in Hashem's eyes, is your David. And yet Sarah knows that. And because of that, he's going to smash everything that you shouldn't daven. He's going to make your davening heavy and burdensome and to make you out of it. And you're getting old, you're a schlep, you're this, you're that. All that is from the exchange chamber. And because you have an address, because you're somebody special, that's why you're being attacked. And the more you're being attacked, because there's something here, there's an investment. That's why the Yetzirah, the Gemara says, the Yetzirah, he abandons the whole world and deals only with the Jews. And then in the Jews, he leaves all the Jews and just attacks the Talmud Chachamim, those who know better, those who know a bit more of the true reality of life, which is revealed to them through the Torah, them the Yitzhar attacks the most, to make them upside down, to make anybody who wants to become a Talmud of the Chacham, a student of the Tzaddikim, of the wise men, the sages, to connect to the true purpose of life, the Yitzhar attacks them the most. So this is the barometer, is that when there's a fight, it's a good sign, it's a healthy sign. Like they always say, the, 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 the analogy, you know, a person who's alive on the heart meter, beep, 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 right? It's going up and down, up and down, he's alive. But if it's, it's straight, straight is great. If there's no obstacles, there's no, he's dead. <laughs> he's dead. There's nothing here, he's dead. If it's straight, eh, the guy's dead. It's dead. But it's, it's nice, it's straight, it's clean, there's no problems. Oh, it's great, but he's dead. <laughs> it's up and down. Dead, 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 dead. That's a sign he's alive. But it's up and down, it bothers, the, the noise also bothers you when you hear it, when you're in the operation room. They, 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 oh, shut up already, you turn off the machine, you don't want to hear it anymore. <laughs> but that's the sign that the person's alive, and that there's a struggle. That's the why we, we came to this world. It's through the Choshech to reveal the light, right? It's Yitron Ha'or, it's a Pasuk in Kohelet. Yitron Ha'or Mina Choshech. The, the value of the light is revealed from the darkness. So perk up, lad. Cheer up, <laughs> hold on, and know that the battle is a sign that there's something here. Because if there wasn't something here at all, you wouldn't have to do <coughs> such difficulty. And comment, Rav Rosa writes this clearly. Take a look there. Because the Shacha Alachahe, Alachah Gimel, it hasn't been really translated yet. It's been partially translated in the book Anatomy of the Soul. In Anatomy of the Soul, they took parts of this, <coughs> this beautiful discourse explaining the ideas of Rav Nosa and Bikot Shacha Alachah Gimel, that you are somebody. You're precious, you're a Jew, and according to your neshama, that's why you, you have such obstacles. And this applies also to a Baal Tshuva, for example, who's born in the middle of nowhere. They threw him in such a garbage environment and everything. It's because if he comes back, his potential is great. He's like a Rabbi Akiva. He's much like a Rabbi Akiva if he makes him. If he holds on all the way, and he does the right thing at every junction, which is what? To David. If he does what David the Melech taught us to do, and he turns to Hashem for every time to turn to Hashem, and David the Melech says, he tra- he's always saying, Ani avdecha, Ani avdecha, I'm your servant. Because uh, uh, David the Melech was trying to get free from the servitude that the world tries to put on the Jewish people, that we're just avadim, we're slaves, we're, we're low lives, we're second class, we're third class. It's not, it's not the real purpose of living in this world. The purpose is to read the news, NBC, ABC, to be popular and everything. And what's Jewish is all schmutz, it's all nothing. But the, that the real truth is the opposite. And that's the avdut. And David the Melech, to, to mitigate that, he was saying, Oh, Hashem, I am your servant. I'm the Evid of you, Hashem. I'm not anyone else's Evid. I'm the Evid, oh, I'm not the Evid of Paro. I'm not the slave of Paro of Egypt. I'm the slave of Hashem. And by doing that, I extract myself from this slavery of being uh, exposed, being under the other side, which is basically this world. So that's our king, and that's, a, that's an important chizuk. When they say, Mishinichnas Adar Marmin Besimcha, 
It's because Amalek, Haman Amalek, he's doing his best in the month of Adar also to pull a person down. That's why we say Marmin Bisimcha. You have to be super strong to overcome the Haman Amalek who's attacking specifically in the month of Adar because of the potential that this month has for your personal redemption, for you making getting a major breakthrough of having a poor miracle in your life. That's why Marbin Bisim. Don't listen to Haman who's saying, ah, this, nothing, garbage, whatever. It Adar, Dafka the month Adar is the last month. The last is the end. Why did Haman pick the month of Adar? Because that's the month that Moshe Rabbeinu passed away. What does that mean that the month that Moshe Rabbeinu passed away? That there is a disadvantage in this month. That there is some type of negativity, there's some type of darkness. However, like the Midrash says, Moshe Rabbeinu was also born in this month. So it has two things. It has the death of Moshe Rabbeinu and the birth. The death is this difficulty, the struggle that of the darkness, the darkness, that the light of the Tzaddik of Moshe Rabbeinu is concealed. And Haman takes this opportunity. Ha ha, I got you. You guys are finished. You're ruined. But it's also the month that he was born. But to, to fight that, I have to be Marvin Besimcha. And Marvin Besimcha is to realize that there's hope. But all this comes about only through the message of the Tzaddikim, the message of David the Melech, the message of Moshe Rabbeinu, that you got to keep on davening and, and realize that the reason why there's an attack is because of the treasure that you're so close to getting to. You're almost at the treasure. It's like the, the beeper, you know, when you're, you're finding gold under the earth, beep, 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 beep. You're getting, you're, it's hot, it's getting there. Your mama sh your mama's there, that's the month of Adar. That's the potential in the month of Adar. Okay, that was just a little introduction before we continue. What we're doing now is Torah, Kuf, Samech, Gimel. This Torah is a continuation to Torah 62. This, specifically the second part of Torah 62, which we did not yet really have a chance to see inside. We started it about the idea of emuna fasting. We started to get into it a little. And the Dibur, the, the Dibur in speech. But here is where Rabbeinu talks about it more openly. And there's more details in this lesson that are not there. Even though there, there's more also. But in a way, it's a continuation. And there's some points here which are not mentioned there. So we're going to see it from the perspective of this lesson, Kuf Samech Gimel, 163, in the first part of the Kutimran. Okay? So like I said, it's like a continuation, but he explains in a better, he explains differently somehow. What, what's not expressed in 62, it's expressed differently in this lesson. And even at the end of this Torah, you'll see that he sends you, he says, and look in lesson 62 for more about this lesson. Like he says, Ayen inyan Torah, elokim bisimat At the very end of the story, he says that. Take a look on this inyan there. But we're going to see from this perspective, because it's a lesson where the focus is on a specific point, which is very important, this edition. So he starts like this. Lifamim, munach hadibur umuchan There are times where a person has speech. We're talking about holy speech. It's munach, it's waiting, laying wait to come out. Muchan The speech, a person, we're talking about speech, we're talking about obviously holy speech, where a person wants to daven, to say holy words, good words. When he talks about dibur, he's talking about holy words. But the words don't come out from their mouth. Watch. <laughs> but the words don't come out from the mouth, rather they come out from the neck. Which part of the neck? Ha'orf is the nape, which is the back part of the neck. And look what he says in brackets here. This is Rabbeinu talking. Umamash efshar lishmoa kama pa'amim sha'adibur eno yotze derech ha'peh rak derech ha'orf. He said, mamash, literally, you can see this at times, that you can hear that sometimes the speech not coming from the person's mouth, it's coming from his nape. You hear this? You say, what, what are you talking about? <laughs> what are you talking about? He says, the Chaim Kramer in the notes, that no commentaries on the Kutimran, and not, not of even the big authorities in Brest of today, like Rabbi Moshe Kramer, whatever, they have a good explanation for this. They're all stuck when they come to this point. There's no good, like, to explain the pshat of this. No one knows of a speech coming out of the, the back of the, of the neck. You know, you have speech coming out of your mouth. But uh, he's saying an idea, though. Because coming up, he's going to say that ha'orif, right, the nape, is the exact same letters as paro, who's the one who wants to trap your ability to speech, that you can't daven. We spoke about this last week in Lesson 62, that you can't daven. The, the main disadvantage when there's a blemish in Imunah, and he says that's reflected in the blemish of eating, it's all connected, is that you can't daven. What does it mean you can't davening? You're saying the words, but there's an expression in English, the words are stuck in the throat. What do you mean the words are stuck in the throat? You're saying the words, but they're not coming out from you. They're not coming out really from, from your, your kishkas, from your essence. They're, they're, they're stuck here. The, the words are not... 
I'm not into the words. You're not into the words of the davening. For example, when davening dibur, saying the words, the speech of the davening, you're not into the words. You're saying it like this. Your head is not there. Your heart is not there. There's no kavana. There's no heart connecting to the words. To explain a bit, words really are, are the nefesh, right? Nafshi yatsa bedabero. It's a, it's a pasuk from Shia Shirim. Rabbeinu develops this pasuk in lesson 31. Nafshi yatsa bedabero. The soul comes out in speech, right? That means dibur has some type of a fire in it. It's called the nefesh. What is the nefesh? Ki adam wa nefesh. The blood is the soul. That means blood, which is heat, energy, soul, and speech are one. Now what gives the push of the blood in the body? The heart. So now, when a, when, what, is the, what is the heart then? We're connecting now the heart, blood, nefesh, and speech. What is the heart? Avodah shebalev zotfila. Davening and speech and kavana, they say. Kavana talev it's called, right? The, the concentration of the heart. When you put your heart into something, <coughs> that's an expression. You see, you put your heart, you put your libo, samit libo davar. you put your heart in the thing, that means the heart is giving the thrust. So the heart is located here, the mouth is up here. The heart, so to speak, through the heart, through the pumping of the heart of the blood, is pushing, giving you the force to speak. So now, if the heart is not doing that, it's getting stuck in the throat. The words don't come out in the dibur. It doesn't come out. Nafshiyat abed abero that the nefesh is coming out and speech is not happening, there's something blocking from it happening. That's the idea of the orf. The paro, and what like we saw last week, or I don't know if we got into it, the three henchmen, the three officials of paro, which is the sar ofim, sar mashkim, sar tabachim, the three officials, right? The wine steward, the baker of the king of paro, and potifar was the sar tabachim. They use through the three pipes in the throat where a person eats not in a holy manner, they use that f- f- power to stop the deeper to come out. Because the throat is an area w- which is very unique. And the throat is the place of eating. And also the throat, this area here, the neck, is the place of speech. Everything happens here. So why these two together? Why does Shem make it? That you have the tubes of speaking and of eating next to each other to show that there's a connection. That a- according to the eating, that's how the speech is. So the, the Yetzirah will use, the evil will use the faculty, the ability of eating if it's done in holiness or not, to break a person's ability to daven, to, to talk, the idea of speech. What's considered dibur? Only dibur which is holy and pure. That's what's called new dibur. Speaking vanity words, words of shtus are not considered dibur. Dibur is only words which have a purpose in life. Words which are connected to the whole creation, where Hashem created the world with the building blocks, which is the, the speech, the holy, holy tongue, Hashem HaKodesh. So, with that, Speech can get stuck in the throat, is an expression, and a person can dive in. And that's what Paro, the Haworth, wants. We're going to get into that now. Watch. Kiesh Shalosh Kripot. Because there are three evil forces. The Kripot, the evil husks, the evil forces, they want to take for themselves, to grab, to gechapt, to trap the speech for themselves. Why do they want to do that? Because speech is the building block of all creation. The Pasuk says, Bidva Hashem, Shamayim Nasu, with this, the word of Hashem, He made all heavens, right? Uvuach Piv Kotzevaam, all the hosts of the heaven. In other words, all creation is through speech. What does that mean? That means the source of all creation is speech. So what does that mean? That everything in creation gets its chayut, its life source, its life force from the Dibur, that's the source. So now the klipot, which is part of the creation, Hashem gave room for the existence of evil, which are called the evil horse, of evil husks, to give them minimal existence. They have minimal, they have minimal life nourishment, life force. They're given minimal. It's like the idea that we wash after eating maimachornim, after eating bread, we do maimachornim, you're supposed to wash a little. Why this little washing of the hands? It's to show the idea we give to the other side a little bit. They need nourishment from the food. <clears throat> so the Maim Achonim is very little. Don't, you don't wash your whole hand. You wash the, the fingertips, whatever. You wash a little bit according to all the different opinions, whatever. You wash a little to give the other side minimal nourishment. So the Klipot exists with minimal nourishment from Hashem. But they want more. The Klipot want their presence to be made known. They want to exist. And they want to have more. Though anything who has life 
wants to live more, wants to expand. That's the way of life, is to live, is to be expanded. So the Klippo, they want always to trap the speech, which is the source of their nourishment, for themselves in order to have more presence in the world. So that's why they're after speech. That's why the Klippo, the, so, the, the evil forces, they're so after that a person shouldn't dove in, and instead the potential of the speech which goes out through the mouth goes to them. They take it. It doesn't come out of the mouth. There's no spiritual force pushing the deep word to come out. There's no lev. There's no nefesh. There's no dam. There's no kavana. There's no kavana in the words. So they get trapped in the area of the throat, the orif, and that gives them nourishment because all these three people coming up are connected to the nape. We're going to see coming up. Okay? So now he says there's levels of speech. You have the speech of a guy from a, a black guy from Harlem. Hey man, what's up? Blah, blah, blah. It's like empty, <laughs> it's empty words. But you have the refined speak of a speech of someone who's a great person. His debor is much greater. Each person, according to their level, that's their speech. You can see the person's level of intellect from how they talk. You can see who you're talking to, uh, the type of person you're talking to when you hear when you hear, when you hear what he has to say and how he talks. So he says, "Bifrat debor kadosh me'adam gadol." Speech which comes of holy speech which comes from a big person, the Klippot want that Dibor more. Because again, it's a unit speech, but there's more energy in it, there's more mileage, there's more power in it when it comes from a big person. Okay, it has more nourishment for them. Because this person who's a Adam Kadosh, Adam Gadol, he's mastered connecting because he's holy, that means his Dibor is more refined in that it's connecting to the Dibur of Hashem and the creation of the universe. It's more holy. And because the Dibur of the creation is the source of all the things in the world, right? So they're more after to connect to the Dibur of Adam Gadol. So it says, Bifrat, in particular, Dibur Kadosh Adam Gadol. <clears throat> they're more after that type of Dibur. It's like a big catch for them. It's a big fish. It's a big prize. Ki etzlam, kol adiburim yafim b'naim v'chashuvim. By the Klippot, all speech, speech as it is, the faculty of speech, even impure speech. The fact that it's speech, all of it for the klipot who are totally black, who are totally in the darkness, it's all considered yafim v'naim v'chashuvim. They're all pretty, all pleasant, and all important. They want speech, because that's the source of creation. Right? Hashem created, you have in the creation, you have the four sections. You have domem, tzomeach, chai, medaber. Domem, which inanimate, like rocks, water. Tzomeach, vegetation, vegetable. Chai animals which can't talk, and then the human is called Medaber. The human is not called Chacham, Pikeach, a wise man. We call him Medaber because the speech gets, gives the category of the man, and Dafka, the speech we said is connected to the creation of the world, which is also through speech. So, by, by the Klippot, speech is precious. Speech is precious. When he sees coming up from this lesson, that the main way to get a person trapped in evil is through the blemish in speech. More than a person doing Averot, the blemish of speech which comes about through Averot, when a person curses himself or curses or talks bad, and as a result of sinning and doing that, that's the main thing that the Klippot are after to get for a person, is the bad speech, which comes as a result of falling, falling down and doing any other Avera, any other type of blemish or sin, when it leads to blemished speech, where a person talks negative, talks bad talk, even talks words of futility, I'm nobody, I'm this, I'm, 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 I'm a nobody and this and that. Those deborium, those words, Yitzhar takes, that's what he wants. That's what he wants to get to. Those words which are blemished, that's the main cause of the Galut. That's the main exile that gives the people their, their power to exist, and which is the exile and preventing the Geula to come. Okay, they were seeing the top sum, and they, the people, they want to grab these words. So again, mikol sheken keshadibur, any di- that's by any speech. So mikol sheken keshadibur nae beemet, all the more so when the speech is really pleasant beemet, and that was coming from a holy person, from a high person. So now he quickly jumps in. Ki abitzrim shayukulam shchorim, because the Egyptians were all, in other words, black, meaning dark skinned, meaning it reflects that they're low, low, low type of people, <coughs> reflects who they were. Even if Sarah wasn't so beautiful, and we're going to see soon why is, he, why is he throwing in all of a sudden Sarah? Would Sarah have to do all this? He's going to explain soon. That's Rabbeinu's way sometimes. He jumps in, he doesn't explain what he's talking about, and afterwards he explains what he's trying to tell you. That's how he is. That's a, it's a way, it's a mahalach in the Likutimran. That he jumps in, 
And then afterwards he explains what he's talking about. <clears throat> Even if Sarah wasn't so pretty, wasn't so beautiful, she would still have been, even if she wasn't Sarah, the wife of Avram Avinu, a tzaddika, and holy and beautiful in everything that she represented. Eshet Chayil, right? Yishayrat Hashem. Also, she would still have been very important in their eyes. So, just to explain, but the people, you know that the story, that, when, that Avram tried his best to hide Sarah, because he saw that you're beautiful, so I'm going to hide you and tell them that you're my sister, not my husband, because they, they, they might kill me if they, they say how beautiful you are and they don't want to take you. And in the end, nothing helped. They opened up the ark, the, 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 the chest, at the, at the taxes, the meches, and they, they saw Sarah, and it says, Vai halalu otas sare paro. Right? It says that the wording is, and the, the ministers of paro, praised Sarah for the sake of the king. This one, Rashi says, Zot This one is fit for the king, for Paro. So we see the wording there is Sare Paro. The ministers of Paro referring to these three Sarim coming up, that we see coming up. The three Klipot are the three ministers which are mentioned elsewhere in the Torah. The Sarah Ofim, Sarah Mashkim, Sarah Tabachim. These three henchmen, these three officials of the king are these Sarim here. Okay. Vadibur, so now what's Sarah have to do with this lesson? Speech is the idea of Sarah. Each, each person according to his level. You have many levels of Sarah, many levels of speech, each person according to their level. First of all, what does Sarah mean? Sarah, Rashi says, means Sarara. Rashi says on the, on the spot of the Chumash that when, when Avram, Hashem told Avram she's going to be no longer called Sarai, rather from now she's going to be called Sarah, so Rashi says, Sarai means my personal ruler. Sarai is like a Sar, my personal minister. And now Sarah, it means like Sarara over the whole world. Sara al kol haolam. She's going to be now a minister of the whole world. Sar, Sarah, what does that have to do with speech? Any ruler, how does he express his, king, his rulership? Through speech. The king, he tells his subjects, I want this done, I want that done. You don't think of a king who can't talk, he just writes. Why is he a king then? If he just he just writes, it's the king before even making a proclamation and signing on a on like when Putin or whatever signs to conquer to annex Ukraine or whatever these guys they sign something. It's first discussed. They first speak about it. I want this done. I want that done. I want to do these type of things. So it's through speech that a sar that any type of minister expresses their rulership, and you listen to them. The, the subjects they listen to what the sar the serara requests. So that's the Dibur, is the idea of Sarah. Each one according to his level of rulership. Yeshu bechinot Sarah leumati. You have someone, it's with the Gemara and Brachot, there's someone who's at the level of Sarah leumati. He's a Sar, a ruler towards his nation. What he, explain, he explains, Shu Moshel badibur shelo al ir medina, like a governor, a governor of a, of, 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 a, of a municipality, of a region, or of a village, of a city. He's the ruler, right? He's the governor of the city, of the town, or of the region. So he rules in his speech. That's how you rule, right? It's unbelievable. That means speech is the koach of a Jew to get things done. Kivyachol, in a way, when a Jew davens to Hashem, and, he, and he's begging Hashem to help, in a way, it's like he's trying to put Hashem under, under you. You're the Jew who's trying to daven to Hashem to do my request. Hashem loves so much the faculty of speech to the koach of Dibur, that it's as if Kivyachol, the Jews asking Hashem, do this for me, as if I can tell Hashem what to do. Kivyachol, by, by what's happening with Dibur, Hashem, it's so precious in his eyes davening, that he's going to put himself under the Jews davening. Hashem needs, it's called Isher Reach Nichoach, right? The davening of a yid is, is mamash for Hashem, like a korban, like a, a pleasant offering that he, that he needs. Hashem, Kivyachol, in a way, he needs your davening. Like that song by Miami Boys Choir, We Need You, We Need Your Tefillin. Remember that song? 20 years ago? You guys remember that? Well, I'll call it song, we, Hashem needs your davening. He needs your davening. He's dependent on it, Kiv Yachel. Because you're, you're Moshel. And that's also the Gemara. It's coming up, I think. It's on in this lesson. It's lesson 62. Tzadik Moshel Be'yurat Hashem. Tzadik Moshel Be'yurat Hashem. That the Tzadik, with his Dibor, rules over Hashem. That Kaddish Buchu goes there. Tzadik Mevatel. Hashem makes a decree, and the Tzadik of his davening is able to, to nullify. That means the davening of the Tzadik is even greater than Hashem? Yes. And that, that Kivyachol, yes, that the Dibur is rulership. That means Jewish speech is powerful. And when you realize that, when you realize that your davening is a value, so you're going to put more force in your davening. But the Yetzirah, it makes you feel 
that your davening is of no value, that you're a nobody, look what you're going through in life, and then after everything you're going through, you expect the daven and to be like a malach, the daven of Fufkochot. So that's how he fools a person and that, that he shouldn't daven. Because he convinces the person that you're not a ben melech, that you're not somebody special. Proof, look what you're going through. And like we said at the beginning of the class, Ajaba, by seeing what you're going through, that shows that there's an adjective, there's something here, there's a, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a treasure here, there's something here. That's why you're going through what you're going through in the first place. So with that, I'm, I'm somebody special. What I'm going through is to show me that I, I, I have something here, and that should push my davening. The majority of people, in the beginning of Avodat Hashem, the beginning of the service of Hashem, they're given this major force, right? It's a major force in davening, it's a koach, right? But then you wait to see 10 years later, 20 years later, 30 years later, most, most people, they begin to go through more of a boxing match in life. That's the real test to see who's gonna continue to hold on and davening with force. Because after going through what people go through in life, the Yitzhak convinces the majority of people, eh, just drop it already. You're not a tzaddik. You'll never be a tzaddik. You're never going to make it. This is the Yitzhak, the biggest attack and the biggest reason why the young people, they're so astonished when, you, when you're young and davening. How come these older chassidim, these older breastlet chassidim, they're not davening in the fire like we have? I'm, I, I'm, I'm in fire. I'm davening, I'm on fire. How come he doesn't have that fire that I have? What's going on? Ah, because he's going through life. And the, the situations of life is punching him so much to the extent that he forgets that he's a ben melech. The real reality is that he is a ben melech. But because also he's so close to the treasure, the, the more you get older in a way, you get closer to your, your tikkun in life. And that means you're closer to the treasure. So because of that, the, the, the war is much more difficult. So it's, it's only understood that people, they, they're having a hard time in davening because the attack is very strong. A person needs to have super duper chizuk and encouragement to realize that I'm a ben melech. I'm Mamash the son of the king and Hashem loves me and I'm precious. And I'm not just saying it, I know it because I see the, the amount of the attack is showing that the, the echo, the kol avara, the sound from the other side is showing me that there's something here. So dafka people, the older they get, they're attacking them even more. And they, they need much more hitchazkut and strength. They have a, a saying in Breslov, it's known by most people, right? For every spoon of what? Hitorut, of, of arousal for serving Hashem, you need a bucket of hitchazkut, a bucket of encouragement. You're going to need it. You're going to need it in life. Ah, right now I'm okay, it's this and that. You're going to need it. Just something personal. When I was a Bachor, and I was reading Rav Nassim's letters, I was so disgusted. I couldn't handle Alim the Chufa. I couldn't handle Rav Nassim's letters. He was saying, he's talking to dead people. I don't need this. I'm on fire. I'm okay. I don't need this. Because he gives encouragement for someone who's almost dead. If you take a look at Rav Nassim's letters, he's giving encouragement to the person who's the worst scenario possible. And at the beginning, <clears throat> when you have this big light as a young teenager, Bachor coming to Breslau, whatever, <clears throat> it was the most uh, repulsive book. I couldn't read it. I think, this, uh, this is giving me Chali Shutada. Not, not only is it not giving me the push, but it's pushing me away, these letters. Ten years later, I came back to the letters. Oh, this is gold. This is what we need to hear. Because that's how it is. In the beginning, you have this force, this energy. I don't, I'm, I'm, I'm full of hit or root. I don't need chazkut yet. It's because there's no treasure here yet. The treasure comes as life pro pro proceeds, as life goes on. A family, children, your awareness of Torah, of life, of yourself, of your neshama, of your tikkun, becomes more and more aware. You're closer to your treasure. So then the attack is more. And then you begin to appreciate the words of Yitzchazkut. You're going to need them. You need them a lot. <clears throat> they say in Breslev that you had many type of people who came to Rabbi Nachman's teachings. There are those type of people who were very interested in the Chidushi Torah. <clears throat> you had those type of people who went to very extreme types of devotions. And you were those who held on to basic encouragement. And they had a saying in Uman, that was like 100 years ago, those breast livers who held on to the encouragement, they held on. They held on through thick and thin. They made it through all the difficulties because they got the point that you're going to need a lot of Yitzchazkut in life. You're going to need a lot. And those who were not after the Yitzchazkut and they didn't invest in having Yitzchazkut when came difficulties in life, they were the first ones to crash Chasisham. First ones to fall. So it's an important point to know that I'm going to need the, the key of Yitzchazkut. So that just went off again, sorry, but to go back now, visit the ship.
the dibur. All this is about the dibur, because your main weapon for everything in life is dibur, is speech, and that's the ikar mashala, the main main force of of rulership. shelo al ir medina. Fine. You have someone who is the aspect of Sarah on the whole world. You have Sarah, like we said, a, a, he's a, a ruler of a mayor of a, of a village, a town, or a vicinity, a region. You have someone who is the, who is the ruler over the whole world. And coming up in Megillat Esther, Sorer Bebeto, someone who is a ruler at home. Right? You have everyone who has what's called Sarara. And uh, by the way, this is an amazing point because the Gemara says on this that when Haman, who, who the Gemara, the, the majority of the opinions in the Midrash, the Gemara say Memuchan was Haman, and it was him who made Achashverosh the idea to kill Vashti, and then to make the second proclamation that each man should rule in his home. So the Gemara says that as soon as they got this this gzera, this decree from from Achashverosh, every man should rule in his home. They start to crack up. What a joker! What a lie! And of course, every man rules in his home. Even the simple tailor, he also has he has to rule. He has to run his home. What is he telling us to rule in his home? So it made a laughing stock of Achashverosh to reveal that he's not. He has no melucha. He had no melucha. But really, so the the. <coughs> Haman was trying to activate the preparation to trap Esther. The, the, just to go off a little, the Midrash says that Esther and Sarah are connected. It says, right in the Midrash, Rabbi Akiva said, how come Esther Malka merited to rule over 127 Medinot of Hashverosh? Because she, being a descendant of Sarah Imenu, who lived 127 years, so it's fitting that she should merit in the, merit, in the, the, the 127 nations. By this, the Midrash makes the connection between Sarah, which is what we're talking about now, the Sarah, and the Yen of Esther. And Haman, <coughs> Rosh explains many places in the Kutah Achot, the plan of Haman who represents all this evil, the Klipot, Paro, everything, that's the idea of Haman, by the way, because Haman, the Gemara says, Haman mina Torah minayin, where do you learn Haman from the Torah? From the Pasuk, Hamina Etz, Hashem told Adam Arishon, could it be from the tree which I told you not to eat, the tree of knowledge of good and bad that I told you not to eat, did you eat from? So by saying that Haman is rooted in the Etz Adat, Tovara, Hamina Etz, it's showing where Haman's power is in the throat, the eating, improper eating. Because that's Hamina Etz, of eating, that, the command. Then Hashem is telling God the Marisha, to punish him, did you eat from the tree of good and, of good and, good and bad? Which is the idea of Haman, Hamin Haman, to show that that's his force, Haman, is the idea of trapping the speech through improper eating. That's the idea of Haman. So by saying Sore Bebeto, by issuing this part, getting Achashverosh to make this Gzera, that each man should be Sore Bebeto, Haman was really trying to prepare the platform for the taking of Vatila Kach Esther, which is compared to Vatikach, Vatukach Sarah Lebet Paro. The idea of Sarah being taken to Paro is the same idea of Esther being taken to Achashverosh. But here, it was supposed to be fatal. A Haman wanted to take Esther in and to trap the Kedusha of Sarah for good. But to do that, the preparation was to make this decree that there should be in the environment, Sorer Beveto, Serara, to get already the idea of Sarah activated. So he got Achashverosh to, to make this decree of the Sorer, which is Serara, this rulership, Sarah, so that it'll be easier for Esther to come in. We'll stop at this point, Bezat Hashem, we'll continue next week, Bezat Hashem, but it's an amazing Torah, which be zochet to realize the power of Dibur, and not to be convinced from the Yetzara that, are, are, that we're nobody, and because of that, that we can't dove in. When you realize that you're something, and your Pintele Yid wakes up, then you see your dove in. You see in life, a lot of times, that after not davening for like a month, two months, three months, a year dead, all of a sudden the Yetzirah squeezes you in a certain situation in life and you just can't handle it anymore. And all of a sudden you make a super duper davening which is coming out of koach. There's davening which is out of ahava, which is out of simcha. You need a schut to get to that. The majority of people who are trapped, their way to get out is first what's called davening out of yira, this boost of yira. Rav, Rav Nossin and Siach Safi Kodesh, they say in his name that he gave an analogy of how come Rabbeinu became who became Rabbeinu. So you bring a mashal of you have a regular soldier, a foot soldier in the army, a regular soldier. It takes many, 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 many years serving in the army until a regular soldier becomes a general. 
right? It takes many years. He has to he has to prove that he's a dedicated soldier, and then slowly they make him up a level, and then slowly another level, slowly, 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 until he can become an official, an officer, a sergeant, a marshal, a general, whatever. It takes time. But sometimes in the middle of a battle, a regular soldier, he does something which is absolutely Nasirat Nefesh, and he does something unbelievable, that on the spot they make him immediately from a foot soldier, they make him to a general. And Rav Nosan said about Rabbeinu, that's what he did. He broke the walls. Rabbeinu wasn't satisfied with what's called in English status quo. Everything's uh, everything as it is. We have Torah, we have Davini, that's how it is. Take it and uh, take it or leave it. That's it. And Rabbeinu, the reason why Rabbi Nachman reached such a high level, because he wasn't happy, wasn't satisfied with what was being offered. He said there's much, there must be much more to Yiddishkeit. There must be much more to Emuna. There must be much more out there. And Chaval just to be limited because that's what society is saying. Don't try to be a higher tzaddik, don't try this, just, just accept what's in the door. Rabbi wasn't satisfied, he wanted the answers, and he got them, and he, what he revealed is now our treasury, what we have now, this beautiful heritage, this Yerusha of all the teachings of Rabbi because he fought. So the idea is on a personal level, that sometimes a person is just too, can't handle the darkness, is just too much, and all of a sudden that's it. He says, Rabbi Nassim explains the Kutel Achot, the Pintel Yid, the holy spark within you is feels that it being it's, it's in danger. It's about to be eaten up and destroyed. And at that point, if you're zochet, the pintel yid fights back. It says enough of this, and the person mamash fights back and gives a super duper davening. Like we said last week, it's a Torah on the on the side ninety nine, tet. And this davening, after five years of davening dead, <laughs> this davening lifts up all the Avodat Hashem that was until now dead. Kiv Right? That means it's always good just to keep on davening, keep on doing, because there come a time when you're going to burst out with force, and that koach is going to lift you up. You should be not to give up, to keep on davening, and to come that we should have Sarah, and the Dibur master of Zedah. She's not a, she wasn't the direct daughter of Moab, she was descendant of Moab, who was the son of the first daughter, the oldest daughter, who had relations with Lot. It goes down the line, yeah. In other words, Lot had relations with his daughter. From that came Moab, which already is disp- despicable. That's already ich, talking about it. And yet, Ruth came from this, and from Ruth was supposed to come David HaMelech. And he had, to, he had to come Dafka from this in order for the Yetzahara to allow such a soul like David HaMelech to come to the world. It has to be that scenario. And that's very appropriate for today. We have so many people who are Tinok Shanishba, Yidin, who are not brought up as Yidin. It's the exact same idea as David Amel coming into the world. To get this Shama to come to his potential, he has to be brought in such a schmutz, in such an upside down situation. That's the only way to get him out. Yeah, like-